Hello, and welcome to this online event. My name is Steve Hardman, and I'm from Degroyter Publishers, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this digital event, Cloud Governance, to demystify the interaction of cloud computing and corporate governance functions. This session is being recorded, and you'll find the video later on our social media channels, and also on Degroyter's YouTube channel. We're going to have about 40 minutes for a panel discussion, and that will give us plenty of time at the end for questions. So if you have any questions or observations, please can you use the chat function. So now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our four speakers. The moderator for the session today is Richard Freeman. Richard is founder and CEO of Always Possible, one of the UK's fastest growing strategic development companies. Richard is a specialist in organizational strategy, social innovation, workforce development and systems leadership. His work has won awards for helping growing organizations to connect better to the bigger pictures around them. And we have three panelists, and the first of whom is Jacqueline de Rocha. Jacqueline is president of Digital Leaders and co-chair of the Institute of Coding. She has a 30-year career in enterprise software, having held senior leadership positions in global tech businesses, including Citrix, CA Technologies, McAfee and Business Objects. She's the former president and current board member at Tech UK and an executive director on several boards and a business mentor at American Co. Jacqueline is a passionate advocate for diversity and inclusion and was awarded CBE in 2018 for services to international trade and technology. Amongst other awards, Jacqueline was voted the most influential woman in IT in 2015 and included in um, the world's 100 most influential people in digital government 2019. Our other two panelists are co-authors of the book Cloud Governance, Basics in Practice, which we are very pleased to have recently published in our new book series, Professors of Practice. Stephen Mezzio is the founder and executive director of the Center for Sustainable Business for the Lubin School of Business at Pace University in New York City, and is a professor of practice and accountancy at the ESG. Stephen was an audit and consultancy partner with PricewaterhouseCoopers and a global division leader of governance services and founder and co-leader of the key client management group of RGP, a US stock exchange listed multinational organization. Last and by no means least is our final panelist, panelist Meredith Stein. Meredith has over 20 years experience in governance, ERM, auditing, compliance and change management. She works for the National Institutes of Health, a US federal government agency. She is also actively involved in governance related learning and development initiatives. And before beginning her federal government career, Meredith worked in KPMG's audit and advisory practices as a manager where she conducted audit audits and Sarbane and Ned Sarbanes Oxley in governance related consulting projects. So before I hand over to Richard, I'd like to say just a few words about De Gruyter. De Gruyter is based in Berlin and is one of the oldest independent publishers in Germany with a history dating back more than 270 years. De Gruyter is a leading publisher of academic content and we also publish books for business professionals. In total, we publish more than 1500 new book titles each year and we also publish journals and various digital products. Everyone attending this session will receive an email afterwards with a link to the recording for today's event. And we'll also provide a discount code for 20% off Stephen Meredith's book. So that's the end of the commercial and I'll now hand over to Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And a very warm welcome to everybody that is joining us from, uh, from around the world. You know, what, a, what an incredible panel um, that Steve's just introduced there of uh, international expertise on the subject of cloud governance. So I'm really honoured to be moderating today's event. My role is entirely to be uh, a useful idiot. I am here to ask the obvious questions, to uh, be the voice of the audience at, at home, because I'm aware that we've got people who will who will know this subject inside and out and be wanting to 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 brush up a little, and there'll be people zooming in for whom this is, you know, perhaps the first time looking in depth at this uh, extraordinary wicked problem. Um, so we hope that all of you, uh, you know, feel able to to ask some questions as well and to to have some clear takeaways. Um, uh, but 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 my role is to, is to guide us through that. So cloud governance. Um, ask ten different people on what that means, and you you, you might get twelve different uh, different definitions. We know that uh, 
as I said, you know, the cloud can be a, a wicked problem when it comes to digital transformation and, and ethics and uh, sharing um, data and security across borders. But we also recognize that, that cloud computing and the direction of travel for, for modern business and public services is, is this hyper connectivity and, uh, and, and in which so much of what we have relied on in terms of our networking and technical infrastructure is being challenged and improved. The opportunities are endless, but are we keeping up with it as humans? And that's what we're going to be looking at today, um, the, the opportunities and problems of the cloud, looking at governance and looking at uh, whether any, a company's cloud journey, how, how to do it well. If it's not done well, does this threaten the, the future of the business? We've seen some, some catastrophic uh, data breaches. We've seen some, some real challenges around cloud going wrong. But if it's done right, what does that look like? What does it mean? Who should be in charge of making critical decisions and of maintaining and evolving and innovating around cloud? And that's what we're going to be having a look at. And today, what we want you to feel by the end of the session is that you might be the cleverest person in your boardroom answering and asking some of the, the, the critical questions about what cloud means for your organization. Um, so I think we'll kick off with with some, as I said, some obvious questions some some overtly simplistic questions to begin with, but I think they're quite important for us to, to really get a sense of what it is that we're talking about here. Um, so I'm gonna start uh, with a question for you, um, Stephen, which is, yep. what is cloud? What are we talking about here? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that, Richard, and welcome everyone. Interesting that we, at the beginning, at the outset of researching our book, we challenged ourselves as to that question, uh, Richard, which was how do we define the cloud? In fact, how do we define governance uh, as well? And we found a wide range of definitions exist in the public domain on cloud, on the definition of cloud. It's, some are technology-based, very, very tech-oriented. Some are simple, uh, complex. Uh, most uh, we found were confusing. And again, we were coming uh, at this book through a basic understanding of cloud computing and cloud governance. Uh, we, we also discovered that many of the definitions are influenced by the lens by which the person or group defining the cloud was taking. So for example, we have a governance perspective on cloud computing in our book. So we took a more narrow governance perspective on defining the cloud. So I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot in terms of a simple definition. Um, we, we landed on one that we thought was practical. So, so the practice of internet-based on-demand access, so internet-based on-demand access to a network of, and this is the important word, remote servers. And, and so the idea is that these servers are outside of the protective boundaries of your organization. So on-demand access to a network of remote servers that store, manage, process data applications and access to networks. And again, importantly, these servers are owned, managed, and in some respects governed by third parties. So it's a bit, it's a bit of a co-sourcing, outsourcing model. And these third-party service providers are generally called cloud service providers or CSPs. And so what are the characteristics of this definition? So, so as I said, a CSP owns, operates, and manages is the cloud infrastructure. It's located outside of the boundaries of the organization, which I mentioned, on-demand access by your organization. So use it as you need it, pay as you go, you, you pay for the services that you use. And a range, a range of models and deployment models exist so, and that we'll talk about later on, but, but access to data services, access to applications and application development services, and, and, and access to infrastructure. The bottom line is that we're looking at what companies were doing already, but moving the data, moving the infrastructure, moving the applications, and in many respects, moving the application development outside of the protective boundaries of the organizations, outside of what might have been considered the in-house IT organization, and moving it and sourcing it to a third-party cloud service provider. Thank you very much. Really comprehensive there. Um, to, to continue this theme of, of defining and 
sort of setting out the context of what of what we're talking about here. I'm going to come to you, um, Jacqueline, to give us a uh, a sense of what we're talking about when we're talking about governance. This is this is a really big issue in business. But what are we talking about when we're talking about cloud governance? I think when we're talking about cloud governance, um, we're talking about how we evaluate and manage the risks and risk tolerance um, of a cloud environment. And um, what is apparent from this book is that it gives the reader a user-friendly, very practical definition um, and explanations of what I would consider to be quite complex jargon. We love three-letter acronyms, don't we, in this in this tech world. Um, but corporate governance therefore involves that balance of relationships between management, the board of directors, shareholders, and, and other stakeholders. And I suppose it's the way that trust is shown and power is exercised. And most importantly, how auditability and accountability is achieved. Um, so I suppose for the purposes of this conversation, we're saying that governance here, we're talking about the board of directors, the internal audit, cyber security, incident response, risk management, and perhaps third party assurance. So that's, that's the sort of bucket I think we're talking about here. You know, I suppose if you if you if you think about it another way, you get a loss of governance in cloud computing when businesses migrate workloads from exclusively on-prem uh, infrastructure into um, into a cloud space, and that's that's the piece that we need to assure, and that's why we have, I think, for the purpose of this conversation put it in the boundaries of, of the stakeholders and the internal audit and, and, and the risk tolerance, I suppose, which again is something that we would need to define for each different business. Sure, makes lots of sense. Thank you very much. And that brings me to, to Meredith. And if we've got this board of directors over here managing the, the risk and the decisions for this entity, whether it's big or small, and then you've got, as Stephen said, these third party CSPs thousands of miles away potentially, servers somewhere, who, wherever, uh, and, 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 the, and the data flying around us. How do these things interact? How do they integrate? What, what, what does one have, how does one have a bearing on the other? Thank you, Richard. Steve and I did spend a substantial amount of time researching and discussing how to best define cloud governance, because as, as you heard from Steve and Jacqueline, that it's two independent and complex domains, the cloud, and corporate governance. In the book, we try to help the reader understand the impact of the cloud, that the, it has an impact on the many governance functions. And the book uh, you know, offers some practical definitions and we landed on one as the foundation for the book and it anchors on, on two parts. The first part is IT related and the second part is business focused. The IT part of the definition focuses on accountability and decision authority, and the business part of the definitions focused on investment and control of the cloud. As Jacqueline said, it's really balancing these resources with risk and offering the business some value. The, the chaos of the cloud is certainly a problem that creates confusion at various points of an organization's journey of, the, of implementing and adopting the cloud and stresses governance in a number of ways. As, as Steve said, the cloud extends the enterprise with third-party cloud service providers, but it also offers opportunities for innovation. It causes new risks and exasperates existing risks. And I think the readers of the book would really find it valuable to see some examples that we've illustrated. We offer a, a compilation of cloud uh, risks in the book, as well as a profile for enterprise risks that boards, management, auditors would be interested in. And just to name a few quickly, the, the biggest one I would say from our research, uh, we found that cloud misconfigurations is a, is a big risk. 
uh, we'll get to this a little bit later when we talk about ROI, but the failure to control cloud expenses and making sure that we have adequate due diligence when selecting a cloud service provider. As, as we know through many news articles recently, non-compliance with data privacy laws is a very big risk for organizations. And um, also, uh, as Steve is acutely aware, the, the lack of skills in the cloud uh, skills gap is certainly uh, at, at the trajectory where we're going today in the business world, certainly experience is necessary to execute a cloud strategy. And so every, every business, whatever sector they're in, is going to be doing some form of transition to the cloud, I imagine, whether that's in a small way by you know having a Google workspace or whether that's fully integrated global connected systems that have far more risk and complexity. Um, so coming, I'm going to come to, to all of you, but I might come back to, to start with you, Meredith, first, and then, and then move back round. You know, what do you think companies should be thinking about in terms of who should do what? Who in an organisation should be leading that transformation um, from the kind of leadership side and the culture and accountability through to the compliance and that day-to-day -day risk management and the data privacy, as, as, you, as you mentioned? You're right, Richard. There are many stakeholders who have a role outside of the traditional IT function that would be involved in cloud governance. The chief risk officer, chief financial officer, the internal audit executive, uh, change management, legal, procurement, the, the list certainly goes on. But obviously, the, the chief information officer in the, in the tech space plays a substantial role to harmonize the IT function with cloud strategy. The, the CIO is, is no longer the IT developer of the 1980s. And the CIO has to articulate how cloud can drive business outcomes without using that complex jargon that Jacqueline mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. The CIO has to convince leaders that the cloud can enable and accelerate innovation and have and drive new revenue sources. Uh, perhaps Steve, you want to jump in and talk about uh, em employees and how they have a role within the organization uh, and as it relates to cloud governance. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think there are a couple of things with with stakeholders, Richard and, and, and Jacqueline and, and Meredith really hit the nail on the head on both of these. I, it, it, the idea that we're talking about cloud computing and in the immediate knee jerk reaction to, to, to some organizations is that this is completely a technology issue. And therefore, let's move to work with our technology specialists, which is absolutely appropriate, the CIO organization, for example. But as Mer Meredith just asked, the, the, the way the cloud works, it really democratizes application building and access to data. And what we mean by that is sort of a fancy term in the public domain that basically says that now we, sitting in, in, the, in, in, in each individual business unit, non-technology people, not necessarily interacting with governance, are now accessing the cloud in our organization independently. We're accessing the data independently, we're accessing applications independently, and, and, and crucially, we're developing new applications independently with direct access between, for example, me sitting in a business unit and our third-party cloud service providers. So when we talk about adding the governance piece to that notion, uh, some of us governance experts, that has our head spinning because there's lots of additional risks, there's lots of additional privacy issues when we no longer have a boundary around access and application development, as we had, in, as Merva said, in, in past more legacy systems. So the real, you know, so, so if I take this up to a bit of a higher level, the real issue here is this is a shared governance situation. And shared governance, what we, what we mean by that is the idea that as opposed to the, the traditional governance protocols in an institution, as Jacqueline mentioned, the internal audit and, and cybersecurity, et cetera, we now have all of us responsible who are holding some level of responsibility for governance. And that entails us understanding what the policies are, us understanding and having the skills to interpret the policy and to interpret our actions. 
And, and the final note I'll make is that we, I come back to this outside of the boundary, the protective boundaries of the organization. This, this shared responsibility model extends now outside of the boundaries of the organization to the third party cloud service provider. And if, if as Meredith mentioned, at the contract development stage, which your CSP, which is cloud service provider, if we're not clearly and specifically defining governance responsibilities between the service provider and the organization, there's nothing good will come out of that. There'll be confusion, there'll be uncertainty, there'll be an expectation that, well, they're doing that, we don't need to do it. Um, so, so lots of critical issues to sort out at the strategy planning development stage that then needs to be carried forward. And, 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 and those of us that have a governance role throughout the organization and outside the organization need to be held accountable, Richard. Thank you. Um, Jacqueline, you're doing a lot of work around leadership in the, in, in the tech space, particularly mm -hmm. in, in the UK. Um, in, in, through that prism or, or, or wider than that, you know, who, who do you think should be leading the, the, the conversation and, and, and the, the, the pragmatic action when it comes to cloud transformation within, within organisations? Well, I'm a, I'm a big believer in that the cavalry isn't coming. So I, I don't ever believe in, you know, it comes from one place. Uh, I, I absolutely concur with what Stephen was saying around, you know, it's everybody's role to make this work and collaboration and partnership, absolutely 100% um, super important because there are micro decisions being made at every layer and faster than before. So I think that's really important. Um, but I think I think more than that, you know, the the point that Stephen made around role clarity, which is, you know, if you don't, whatever you outsource, actually, there has to be incredible um, transparency around role clarity, because otherwise you can't um, possibly give that piece of work, that parcel of work to somebody else. So I, I believe that that role clarity is really important, but it does. Um, you know, it does require, because it's a major IT transformation, it does require that shift in company culture. And that's what I'm talking about, I think, from, you know, everybody needs to be involved versus a hierarchical, you shall do this or you shall do that. So that, that, that's what creates the agility and all the benefits associated with cloud. Because with cloud comes, you know, fast, facil it, it facilitates much faster changing implementations it reduces time lag but that that also implies that you need a more autonomous style of leadership to make it all happen so it's more likely to be peer-reviewed than it is to be you know leaning over your shoulder saying right okay have you done what I've told you to do so I think there is a monumental change associated with an organization's cloud journey and a company does need a change management strategy to manage risk minimize uh, wasted effort and cost um, and I think what's wonderful about the book is that um, it does advance well-established change management frameworks that can contribute to effective cloud adoption and that's really critical because transforming into a cloud-enabled workforce is part of the people side of change management so we can't just be focused on the technology side. And a cloud enabled workforce is exactly that. It has roles and skills that they need to be equipped with to drive cloud success. It probably means lifelong learning because these things shift all the time. And that implies you know, business cost, of course, um, and an innovation cost if the organization is not equipped with the right skills. Because let's face it, if any of this goes wrong, business continuity is, is, is the problem. And so um, we have to get the skills right. It's not an option to have a cursory look at these things. These things are what make a migration um, to the cloud effective and what, what makes it work efficiently. So it does require new skills. I think, you know, if you want some examples of addressing um, gaps in cloud skills in an organization, you do have to hire employees um, who do have the right cloud experience. You do probably have to um, fill 
the gaps with some temporary roles um, from um, specialists who have specific expertise. You know, that might be hiring temporary uh, contractors. Um, it might be relying on vend vendors to supplement that shortage of resources. It might be, you know, designing specific modules to create those micro interventions um, and those lifelong learning moments that, that we have to do to keep up to speed for existing employees. Um, but you can't drag them kicking and screaming. I think there is something around it which has to be mission focused and yeah. a positive attitude towards this is the journey we're going on to cloud. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to dig down a little deeper on, on this change management and, and the skills question there uh, in a moment, because I think that's absolutely fundamental. I do have a quick follow up question for Meredith and Stephen, um, uh, uh, particularly around roles and understanding their roles and responsibility. When I was reading the book uh, in chapter seven, I was quite taken about um, forgive me if I've misread this, but just how kind of legally protected a lot of these CSPs are when things go wrong. But but probably there's quite a lot of businesses that don't fully understand that and and think perhaps that they might be able to get more <laughs> more from from those providers or be able to hold them more to account. Well, actually, there's there's often very little on them. Um, and I just wondered if 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 that kind of legal responsibility, you know, in your in your, in your experience, you know, do you do you think that that's fully understood or grasped when when organisations are are going through this transformation? Go ahead, Meredith. It it is certainly, and I think when we think about the cloud service provider and the organisation procuring the cloud services. It is really the responsibility of the organization of the business uh, for the governance of the cloud. And that includes compliance with laws and regulations and management certainly has to be sensitive to the gray areas and avoiding that misinterpretation, making sure that they define those responsibilities. Uh, you know, a good, a good way to do that, of course, is this is a standard uh, service level agreement I think that's a really important way to make sure that everyone understands uh, what the responsibility is of the cloud service provider and what the responsibility is of the organization. And I think the some, some of the things that would help control some, some cloud costs would be elaborated in a service level agreement. It's certainly an essential component of good governance to to bring it back to your point, Richard, of how to be the smartest person in the room, uh, people listening could ask management and the board could ask management, you know, what service level agreements are in place with cloud service providers? How many providers does the organization have that and they're contracted to do business with with the cloud? What does the primary cloud service provider, do they subcontract any of the cloud services to, uh, to, to other vendors, making that fourth and fifth party extension of the enterprise um, a, a risk factor for the organization. So I think management has to review any existing service level agreements and understand what terms there are included to, to understand the data rights, uh, any sort of legal protections, any sort of usage, because I, I think that would also get to helping to uh, control cloud spend. So that really is something, isn't it? When when it might be, yeah, two or two or three yeah. organizations removed, perhaps, and 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 comes back to Jacqueline's point around change management and, and sort of cultural understanding. It's that that curiosity, that spotting those detail, that being able to to, to ask questions about well, what are the implications of this for us and how does this change who we are uh, if, if, uh, if, if we're getting into those sorts of relationships blindly um, is really, really important. Um, just a, a note to the audience, please do um, fire questions if, if, uh, if, if things we're talking about are inspiring thoughts or, or questions. We will come to them towards the end, but do feel free to put them into the chat bar. Um, but Stephen, I might, I might come to you then about Kind of change management and the implications yeah. for learning and development within organizations building on the, the the points that we've just heard there do do you think that cloud transformation ultimately is any different to any other kind of uh organizational change um 
if so, what what are those implications? What do, what 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 do, do organisations need to be thinking about differently in terms of training, support, and that sort of cultural uh, curiosity? Yeah, thank you for that. That's that's really such an important issue, and um, really, some organisations are struggling a bit with sorting through that. Uh, it, it, let, let me just start out by saying that that. I, I, my hats off to Meredith and Jacqueline because because they both said the same thing that that at the end of the day, the, the governance of the cloud is the organization's responsibility. Full stop. And, and so that that has implications all through, including change management and, and learning and development. So I, I think that 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 there are very important differences between looking at perhaps major initiatives at scale that require change management over the last five years or so. And then what we're seeing, not just with the cloud, but with digital 4.0 generally, with, 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 with the technology revolution generally, is the velocity of, of, of change and the complexity of change. I think those two things is the speed and the complexity around change management when it relates to something like cloud computing. As, 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 as Jacqueline pointed out, this is not just a technology change. This is not just a business process change, not just a strategy change. This is really a cultural change as well. It's just, it's really turning on its head some of the ways that the more experienced people in an organization understood. And certainly the younger generation coming in will, you know, will need to be up to speed on their individual as well as collective responsibilities. Not, you know, and when we talk about cloud governance, we took great pains in the book to introduce the notion that strategy and performance management are part of cloud governance. So, so you know, often when you hear the word governance, many of us think, well, that's just sort of controls and risk and the board of directors, uh, but, but it's really strategy rooted and performance management rooted. So not only managing the downside risks, but managing the upside promises of, of cloud computing and ensuring that we're meeting the expectations that we had on making these monumental investments, not in just, in just technology, but in, 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 in resources and people. On the learning development side, which, which, which again, we took, we took great pains to address in the, in the book, it's complicated, but, 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 but essentially doable. And, and so the idea is that our book is a good example. Our book, we, our subtitle is Basics and Practice. And the basics issues was important. Uh, when I speak to boards and I speak to C-suite and I speak to organizations generally at all levels on a learning and development side, not everyone needs to be an expert in cloud computing or just as not everyone needs to be an expert in ESG. ESG is another you know, major cultural shift in, in institutions right now going through change management. So the idea that if 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 I were you know if I were sort of leading an effort on the learning and development side of the change management piece in an organization around cloud computing, I would want to work with a diversity of representatives around uh, leadership around the organization and say, look, we need a certain level of just basic literacy around cloud computing on what it means that it's more than technology that it has implications for all of us. So, so, so Richard, a basic foundational understanding of cloud computing and the implications on the organization. And then as you move up that chain of knowledge, we become more and more of experts, including those involved in the governance mechanisms around the organizations. So internal audit is a major governance function, for example. We wouldn't expect everybody in the internal audit organizations, you know, some companies have two, 300 people in internal audit, some large organizations. But we would want a cadre of experts that then can be that can have a seat at the table at the experts table uh, in the organization when when we're when they're discussing highly technical issues. So I think on the learning development side, what I'm suggesting in summary is is a planned effort for certain levels of transparency that dovetail into certain levels of expertise. And as, as Jacqueline pointed out, that's not going to be easy to hire. Those are in huge demand at the moment. So a sourcing model where we bring in contractors or consultancy firms on a temporary basis to not only help with the learning development, but to help fill uh, potential gaps around the governance mechanisms would be, would be part of, I think should be part of the strategy. There's a phrase you use in the book a few times, which I quite like, um, kind of cyber resiliency, and that being a kind of driver behind learning and development. Yeah. Um, Jacqueline, I'll, I'll come to you maybe. I, I, 
you know, in, in, in times of economic turmoil, we know most countries around the world are, are in or out of or close to recession at the moment. It's, 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 been, it's been a tough few years and things like learning and development can be the first to get the chop where the businesses are making um, decisions around spend. Uh, but it sounds like from everything that's being said, this is, this is critical stuff and this needs to be invested in and there needs to be a good case for this. Do you have any tips or thoughts on, on how to make the business case for the inevitable staff training around cyber resiliency and, and the advanced skills at the top end audit and so on, or, or the basic skills that, that Stephen was talking about at the sort of the, the junior end? It's, it's really interesting you, you asked that because I believe that the companies that will prevail are those that perceive learning and development and investment in their people as how as part of how they build their competitive advantage and those that do not are the ones that will be left with the you know the talent that isn't up to speed and um you know i really feel that we are seeing we are going through um economic uh pressure clearly there are companies that are doing well there are companies that are not doing well and some of those are surprisingly not doing well and I think that's because underinvestment in talent um, is a problem because what they're doing is they're you know the churn is high the technology talent churn is high and you can't just grab people um, because there there you know there are just so there, there aren't enough people out there who are specifically specialized in this kind of space and so the only way we're going to build that competitive advantage is through um, learning and development investment in-house. And, um, you know, I think particularly those micro injections of learning that enable you to go from, you know, this um, part of the project to the next part of the project, and then you move on. So I believe it's, it's, um, it's foolish. Uh, not to invest in learning and development. And, and I think we will see that writ large in the companies that prevail as we go through periods of economic crisis. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Stephen, you mentioned DSG there um, yeah. uh, just now and, and the, 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 the potential opportunity and implications that this has. The G bit obviously is governance that we've, we're talking about in, in quite a lot here. But in terms of the E and the S bit, uh, in, environmental uh, and, and, and the social, um, you know, how effective can uh, new, new approaches to cloud governance or cloud, cloud governance transformation processes be in helping organisations with their ESG strategy? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we devoted a chapter to this and, and uh, we were all very passionate about this topic. And, and, and as we said, how do we, what's the intersection of cloud computing and ESG basically is, is the question, isn't it Richard? And, and, and so we looked at it from, we, we, you know, we did our research and we looked at it from two perspectives. Uh, one was um, here we are now, we're moving major sourcing, moving out of the boundaries of the organization, some major activities, including servers, yeah? And, and so there's a lot of technology uh, being uh, now owned and operated by a third party provider, but to our, for our benefit. And what we're seeing generally in ESG is certainly what I'm seeing is that more and more transparency of your supply chain and then transparency of your responsibility, whether or not you have it within the boundaries of your organization or not, if you outsource something, development of a product or third party cloud services, you are gonna be held accountable by the community at large, by your stakeholders, by your employees, for example, as to the performance and the impact of that third party on the E and the S and even the G for that matter. And so one of the pieces we looked at was what types of metrics and what types of expectations might we put into the service level agreements or the contracts with the third party service providers with respect to their greenhouse gas emissions and with respect to the environmental implications of their operations. Now, the good news is that the major cloud service providers are on top of this and, and they've already proactively sort of built into their contracts, uh, metrics and responsibilities around that. 
The, the second way we looked at the cloud's implications on cloud computing was how can it help us internally with all of this complicated reporting and data gathering and metrics uh, that we need as an organization to compile, analyze, sort through, and then communicate and report to the public and to our stakeholders. And, and so we're seeing really, we have some examples, we're seeing great illustrations by organizations on how the cloud, because of the easier access to data, the easier access to manipulating and analyzing data, uh, is, is really adding to the productivity and the efficiency. And in some cases, the trust of the data being used for organizations, ESG disclosures and reporting, uh, as, as probably the audience knows, regulations around the world now are becoming uh, more strict than ever in terms of holding organizations accountable for what they say, how they say it, what commitments they're making, and looking at metrics around short-term milestones on whether or not they're meeting those commitments or not. And, and so we see uh, great illustrations of how the cloud on the data gathering, data analysis, data wrangling, and even part of the governance and trust around the data being, um, you know, high high levels of efficiency and productivity coming out of that. And there's a there's a there's a really good list of the sort of stewardship commitments from some of the, the providers, yep. the big tech organisations in your book. There, um, clearly, some are, are further ahead than others, but it's really useful to see. Um, where they are on that journey. Um, the the e, the e bit and the G bit almost seem a little more um, straightforward, perhaps, in terms of measurability. It's the S bit in ESG, I think, that's sometimes a bit harder. Um, you know, Meredith, do you, do, you, do you think that sort of the cloud transformation, cloud governance can have a, a big impact on uh, on, on the ethics, on, 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 on behavior, on, on the way that an organization treats its staff and so on as well, and, and, and looks at its kind of social commitments. Do you, do you, do you see uh, clear links between the two? Yes, absolutely. And to, to dovetail to one of the questions in the chat about the intersection with the cloud enabled AI, you know, the thing I think about at top of mind when I think about artificial intelligence is data privacy and ethics and understanding where the cloud service providers maintain their servers are our governments you know um, being able to access that information unbeknownst to the organization that might be in another country uh you know the the ai certainly will help supercharge organizations to help you know synthesize large amounts of structured and unstructured data and also understanding how that data can help management make important business decision. So I do think it is important part of the S in, in ESG for sure. And as we see more and more regulation coming out from the UK and the United States on data privacy and ethics and the, the correct use of you know how to use AI in an ethical way, this will be more and more part of the, um, the, the future of the cloud. And, and we devote a whole chapter on the future of the cloud in the last uh, section of our book. Yeah, and just to add quickly to that, um, AI and in fact the metaverse generally, more and more the research we did really points to the direction that the cloud is the will be one of the foundational pivot points for launching or scaling AI and other parts of the metaverse. And and so we come back if the if the governance around the cloud foundation to these other emerging technologies is not solid, then then by extension, those technology, the governance around those technologies will, will not be solid. So cloud governance really is not just around the cloud, but it's a, as a foundation launching point for other other technologies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and thanks, Scott, for your question there about AI. I was um, going to come to that, but, 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 but maybe let's stick with that for a minute about the evolution of, of AI, uh, rapid as it is, uh, obviously, we saw the open letter a couple of weeks ago from from some vested interest asking to slow it down a little bit, particularly <laughs> because of this this issue around around ethics and, and governance. Um, interesting to see who had signed that, though. Um, Jacqueline, this must be a hot topic in your circles. I know from sharing panel discussions with on tourism and, and agriculture and engineering, um, pretty much the dominant question coming up in those forums is 
what does AI mean for us and how do we how do we get our heads around it, um, particularly in terms of of risk. So, um, so in the tech sector, uh, you know the, the evolution of AI and and what that means for for cloud governance and AI of, you know, of itself being being you know in lots of integrated systems from different sp spaces. What do you think um, the future looks like with that, and what do we need to bear in mind? Well, well I'm, firstly, I'm amused that um, slowing down technology. I'm, I'm always amused when people um, ask us implicitly to uninvent something uh, <laughs> right. in the tech space. Uh, well, and and, and, and to of, put it back in the box. <laughs> yes, put it back in the box. Um, and you know, clearly, it's only going in one direction, which is there's going to be more of it. Uh, and like anything in technology, we have a decision. It is an enabler. So we have a decision whether to use it for positive impact or for negative impact. And there, you know, there are people on both sides of, of the line. I think the question for us is how do we now at scale, and we've got chat GPT and all of these things now coming to challenge us around, I was listening to a podcast the other day around what do we do in education now that we have chat GPT out there? Because, you know, what's, and I think this is a really important future existential question for all of us. And I don't have the answer, but I do have the question, which is, you know, what is information and what is disinformation? Um, and that's, that's going to be, I think, one of the things that occupies our minds as we walk forward into this new, um, new world. And, and, and for, for chat GPT in, in, in terms of you know, education and that whole AI-ness of, of how students are using it, um, yeah. we may have to now um, examine and mark our students in a different way based on less about content, for example, but you know, critical thinking and problem solving. So, I think the world will change, not only from an ethics perspective, but how we decide to measure uh, uh, output from AI based um, information. So, I mean, there is it's a it's a whole new um, conversation, I think, Richard, but we can't uninvent it. I think we have to make the best of it. And there is always the positive and negative aspects of it. But um, I'm looking forward personally, optimistically, to a future yeah. that is enabled. Uh, using As I say, AI. It, was, it, it was interesting who, who signed that letter. It might be more of a question yes. of who, who controls it rather than what, what speed it's, it's happening. Um, but that, exactly that's, for, right. that's for another day. Um, I do want to, uh, to, to have a quick look at um, questions about the board and, and, and the kind of role of people on on the board when we're talking about governance broadly. And I think it plays to a lot of these other points that we've been making around decision-making skills and knowledge. Uh, but obviously a big part of governance is around minimizing spend waste and avoiding spiraling costs. It's about understanding any return on investment and there will be investment required here. Um, so, you know, do you, do you think, and this is to, to all of you, you know, that there should be on every board, a director that's particularly Spotting up on on cloud governance and is really understanding that brief and so is able to to ask the questions. You you use a line in the book as well. Well, it's it's, it's you know it's, it's 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 a known line, but this idea of a duty of reasonable inquiry and asking those questions and being the kind of flea in the ear on the board, saying, well, why are we doing this and what are we doing and is it is it too much? Is it too little? Do you think that's a role for like an individual and each person and, and to, to go deep with it? Or do you think really this is something for everybody? If you if you sit on a board, then you need to understand this stuff and, and there should be support for people to get their heads around it. I don't know who I'll, wants to take I'll that. Jump in, Richard. Yeah. I think certainly uh, if, if cloud governance or even AI generative governance is not yet on the board agenda, it needs to be just like Jacqueline said, it's all about the conversation. So starting even with just some simple questions on what should be considered as it relates to you know, the opportunities and the risks on um, the journey for the organization to use AI, uh, the organization to use cloud, that it certainly has to think about how management has the responsibility 
to educate the board on cloud literacy and AI literacy. I think it's really important uh, to consider those, uh, those key questions. And we have a, a, a list of, of many just to start the conversation. And I imagine that uh, it'll roll over to multiple meetings that, that once you get started, you won't be able to stop. But that's the, the greatest outcome is, is having that dialogue with people from across the organization to start thinking about how it impacts the different segments across the enterprise. If anyone else in the, in the uh, audience listening has a question, now is the time to submit it before we we uh, run out of time. Um, yeah, I think there's one there's one in the chat. Can I just add though, real, very quickly, yeah. that on the board issue, and I think this somewhat relates to the question in the chat as well. We felt very we feel very strongly, and, and we mentioned it in the book that the, the level of sort of literacy amongst the board should be evaluated. And what I mean by that is that there, there probably needs to be some notion of a training around, um, at least a basic training around um, the cloud and, and, and cloud computing and cloud governance for the, for the board. And this doesn't stop at the cloud. This is happening with sustainability at the moment, with DEI. There's, there's so many things. There's so much change going on right now. And, and, and to be fair to the board, you know, they come in for short periods of time, generally given very little time to prep or giving very short time to get materials to prep. And, and and then suddenly they're, they're 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 expected to ask the right questions. So I think that a little bit of training for the board periodically is is hugely important. And I think the second thing is, you know, the audit committee back in the Sarbanes Oxley days, there was, there was a regulation that said you have to have a financial expert sitting on the audit committee that understood financial statements because of all the frauds that had taken place before and the lack of understanding by some of the audit committee and board members. And I see going forward now things like change management and things like disruptive technologies. Uh, those are now skill sets that uh, that I would argue strongly that we need an expert on the board uh, for these kinds of things going going forward. Yeah. I think I would agree with that. I, I also worry about where we're going to get them from, though, Stephen, um, yeah. because you know, and that that's why the lifelong learning matters. And as you say, you know, giving that level of, of literacy really does matter we've done it with cyber security in the uk we've got the national cyber security center a you know government body um, and we have put a board toolkit together specifically for cyber and i do rather feel that we can follow that model um, with someone who wakes up in the morning and worries about governance and cloud governance too because um, this is again all about you know risk mitigation um, about reputation and making sure that we don't waste the resources of, um, of of businesses. So I think we do need someone who who does take on that role. Yeah. Um, there's two two questions in the chat. I, you, you you've all touched a little bit on on uh, D. A. Robinson's one around generative AI, but but there's 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 something else in there when he uh, or she apologies um, asks about how do you encourage a company to move quickly on, 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 on some of this? And, and for me, action yep. is always predicated on one of two motivations. It's either a, away from pain or it's towards opportunity. Um, we've talked a lot yep. about risk and about mitigation, but I wonder if we, you know, something more positive around this kind of towards, towards pleasure, towards opportunity, towards the kind of sunny uplands. Yep. How, can we get, how can we get our organizations to seize the day on, on, on this more effectively? I don't know if you've got a quick, quick yeah. thought on. I, I, a quick thought, a couple of quick thoughts. I, I just had this conversation with a with a roundtable I did with the board, and and the idea was this this notion of a seat at the table, that that, that expression, and what you know the, the seat at the table simply means are the right people sitting around that need to be there with a diverse a diverse level of perspectives, so you have a holistic view of what's happening on any topic, and and so what we find sometimes with the cloud is again, it tends, to, it tends to be a knee jerk, this is a technology issue. And so you might have the CIO come in very well equipped and, and very knowledgeable, but speaking in jargon that most of us wouldn't necessarily quickly sort of comprehend and understand. And so I think to, to get action moving, particularly on the promises of the cloud, you know, the, the people responsible for the strategic sort of vision of what the cloud is gonna provide for the organization, not just what, but when and what the milestones are, you need to have a seat at the table with the, with the major 
governance influencers around the organization to talk about, are we gonna meet our expectations? Are we making a cost benefit analysis? Meredith mentioned cost overruns. We have, we have profiles of companies that just had massive cost overruns on cloud deployment. And, and so, so I think getting the right diverse views uh, at the table, so to speak, is, is, is essential. Um, we're, we're, we're fast running out of time, but I didn't know if, if, uh, if others had a, a quick thought on that point. If not, then I'll, then I'll, I'll bring in Scott's sort of final question, which is building on the ESG conversation earlier, but I guess more specifically, are you in, 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 in your networks and in the businesses and organizations you're working with seeing people use cloud, uh, the migration to the cloud as a way to lower their own carbon footprint or to, to, to minimize some of the emissions and, and, and put that in their reporting structures. Is that something that people are, uh, again, maybe seeing as this opportunity rather than, 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 than just a, a risk thing? Um, yeah. Meredith or Jacqueline? Go ahead, Meredith. So, uh, can, can I jump, jump in here just quickly yeah, and give Meredith the final word? Perfectly. So one of the things that I certainly see um, in the UK is that 66% of all jobs come from small businesses. And so their opportunity is definitely um, the cloud because they don't want to be experts. They want to, you know, in technology, they want to take advantage of a service that is being offered by a third party. And that that is clearly cloud-based. And we've actually, here in the UK, put forward um, uh, the uh, request of, of the Treasury uh, in government to offer um, tax breaks for OPEX, operational expenditure, operating expenditure, so that this can be something that is um, encouraged for small businesses rather than um, only solving for the large businesses. So I think it's, you know, it's a really good example of how we can use um, policy to sway people to use um, cloud as an opportunity to become much more um, web oriented, internet oriented, internet savvy without having to be experts themselves. So I'm, I'm really excited about that as an opportunity. Meredith. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, certainly as, uh, as Steve and Jacqueline indicated, there's certainly ways that organizations are using the cloud to help sustainable strategies. And there's also examples in our book related to uh, how cloud service providers have environmental stewardship commitments to 100% renewable sources, net reaching net zero by certain years. Some have already achieved that. And I think it is really important when we, we uh, discuss and have some call out boxes about how um, you know, water consumption is you know, that much more saved because cloud service providers, there's a lot of water used to um, you know, run the servers in these large computing data centers that now we don't have these individual data centers in an office building, it's centralized. So there is some savings there. Um, it does talk about how, um, you know, from a reporting perspective, and Steve touched upon this, the cloud can certainly serve as a powerful tool for organizations to improve ESG reporting. And we have a couple of tables that indicate in the book around how um, certain cloud service providers can provide uh, reporting around uh, scope, scope one, two, and three emission data and that relates to greenhouse gas emissions. So I do think that it is certainly crucial for management to consider ESG factors in context of the cloud, for sure. And as always, we each have a responsibility to act on the world's social and environmental challenges. Wonderful. Thank you. What a, what a rich conversation there. So much to pack in in such a short amount of time. This is a big, big issue. Um, so uh, thank you so much to, to, to the three of you for your insight and wisdom. Um, lots to take away there about, about uh, uh, decision making and, 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 light, and, and, and continual learning and, and, and being curious and, and, uh, and, and, and clearly buy, buy this book or get a copy of uh, <laughs> governance. It's all in there. Um, Steve, over to you to, to do the final uh, words. Yeah, well, Richard, thank, you very, thank yeah. you very much indeed. Um, as I said earlier, we will send a link to everyone um, who's attended this session with, uh, with a link to the video. Sorry, we send an email to everyone with a link to the video. Um, there's also the 20% discount code we will give everybody. So thank you very much for attending this event today. Richard, um, you've done a great job as always in, in, in moderating this discussion. So thank you very much indeed. 
And I'd like to thank uh, Jacqueline, Meredith and Steve. It's a really interesting discussion. I think we could have gone on for a lot longer and I thought you brought some clarity to what is a pretty confusing issue. So thank you all very much indeed. It's been a, a very interesting discussion. Thank you.